Yeah, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be speaking here today. Um, yeah, I'll be talking about the hidden forces underground, soil biodiversity for agricultural production and environmental integrity. So I think we all know that there's organisms living in the soil and um, it's actually a huge variety of creatures living there and they are all doing things. So they are eating organic matter, they're feeding on plant material, they're feeding on each other and um, they bury through the soil, they poop in the soil, they eat each other's poop. So there's this whole complexity of, of um, things happening and uh, together these actions um, result in certain ecosystem functions. Um, and these ecosystem functions can result in ecosystem services that we as humans also depend on. So um, soil organisms are important for organic matter decomposition, for example. Uh, they can improve soil structure and water infiltration. They can store nutrients, release nutrients, um, yeah, improve plant nutrition, provide pest control, and so on. However, it's been increasingly increasingly shown in recent years that um, with increasing land use intensification, a lot of these organisms are actually negatively affected. So they get reduced in their diversity and abundance um, and can even go locally extinct in certain fields. Um, and now the big question is, uh, if we lose these organisms, do we also lose these important functions that we depend on? Or if we phrase it more positively, um, if we promote organisms and find ways to promote these organisms in soil, can we actually improve our ecosystem functioning and uh, get more sustainable cropping systems? So to put this in a theoretical framework, um, when we look at um, a natural ecosystem. We, we have usually a relatively high plant diversity. We have a rich um, and diverse soil life and we have very efficient internal resource recycling processes that keep this system um, alive over long time spans. So it's a very sustainable system, but it's not very productive in agricultural terms. When we compare this to an intensive agricultural system, um, we often have a huge amount of external resource inputs. You have crop monocultures and soil life is not doing so well. So we have less well-developed internal resource recycling processes. And we also have much more uh, losses of nutrients, for example, um, to the groundwater or as gases emissions into the atmosphere. So these systems are very productive, but they're not sustainable. So ideally, we want to combine aspects of both to create a sustainable system where we have less external inputs required. We have an intermediate diversity on the field and we have a rich and abundant soil life. So we have very well developed resource recycling processes and little losses to the environment. So we have a productive and sustainable system. But first of all, um, we, we have to answer the question, how important are these soil organisms actually for ecosystem functioning? And um, to find that out, I, I performed um, an experiment a couple of years back in so-called lysimeters. So lysimeters are basically big pots um, placed in the outside and free air. And each lysimeter can hold a soil volume of 230 liters. Um, we filled these lysimeters with sterilized soil and then added two different soil biological treatments. One we called the enhanced soil life treatment containing soil organisms smaller than four millimeters. And the other one was the reduced soil life treatment that only contained organisms smaller than 11 micrometers. So basically um, microorganisms, but nothing else. Um, these lysimeters have a hole in the bottom where the water running through the soil profile can be collected and later analyzed for nutrients. And we also performed gas measurements of nitrous oxide and N2 gas um, into the air to look at uh, nutrient losses. So we planted a maize crop in these lysimeters and let them grow to maturity. So they got big maize plants as you would find it in the field. 
And when we look at the data, so we see these dark bars are the enhanced soil life treatment and the light gray bars is the reduced soil life treatment. Um, what we found was that with reduced soil life, crop yields when were significantly lower. And we found a similar pattern for nitrogen uptake and for phosphorus uptake, the effects were um, strongest. So actually it was uh, more than half the phosphorus uptake with reduced soil life. Looking at the nutrient losses, we found the opposite pattern. So um, with reduced soil life, nitrogen leaching losses uh, went up massively and the same was the case for nitrous oxide emissions an important greenhouse gas and also n2 another gas being emitted um, was massively increased so this study shows that soil organisms have a great potential to enhance the nutrient use efficiency and support crop growth in uh, cropping systems but it is um, a model system and actually most knowledge we have about soil biodiversity and how it affects uh, ecosystem functions is derived from such model systems that often use sterilized soil so we have to re-add organisms and um, yeah we actually do not know how well these results transfer to um, the real world to an agricultural field so I was trying to get um, yeah closer to that and get some 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 answers in real world settings. I um, did a postdoc in California at UC Davis, and uh, there I went to 30 different field sites, um, differing in management intensity. So I selected 10 grassland sites and 10 more sustainable tomato rotations that uh, received cover crops over the winter and. Um, compost applications, and then 10 intensive tomato rotations that only receive mineral fertilizers and synthetic pesticides and so on. So I expected um, reduced abundance and diversity of soil organisms with increasing management intensity. So I went to all these sites and we um, sampled and analyzed the soil communities. And we also extracted soil cores from all these fields, placed them in a greenhouse, planted tomato crops there, and um, um, yeah, measured nutrient leaching losses and gas emissions and looked at crop yield also. So when we look at the data for the soil communities, um, you always see the grasslands on the left and uh, the intensive systems on the right. So we found that with increasing management intensity, indeed most parameters for soil organisms showed a negative trend. The more intensive the system was, the less diverse and less abundant soil organisms there. Then uh, we related this data to some ecosystem functions that we measured. So here we see um, the relationship on the left um, with microbial biomass in the soil and tomato yield. We found a significantly positive relationship. So with more microbial biomass, we had higher tomato yields. Similarly, we found for the more um, nematodes we had in the soil, we also found higher crop yields. Looking at uh, nutrient leaching losses, um, we found some relationship with the ratio of fungi to bacteria in the soil. So the higher this ratio was, the lower the nitrogen leaching losses were, which is something that has also been shown before and hypothesized that um, a fungi dominated system has a more close sustainable nutrient cycling compared to a bacteria dominated system. So um, yeah, taken together, this study could partly confirm what we found in the model system, which was very nice. Um, and then I performed a different study focusing on Abascular mycorrhizal fungi, or short AMF. We heard about mycorrhizal fungi before. Savarina was manage, um, mentioning them. And uh, yeah, um, these fungi form symbiotic relationships with the majority of land plants, and including many major crops like maize, wheat, potato, tomato, and so on. And they are um, mostly known for improving plant growth and nutrition. And there are also other benefits that uh, have been shown to be um, provided by AMF. So the way this symbiosis works, um, we see here a microscopy picture of a plant fruit. 
and the blue structures is the AMF structure and they actually enter the plant root, even the plant root cells and um, develop there, then they spread a network of fungal hyphae into the soil. So here we see the plant root and then we see these fine root structures spreading out in the soil. So basically they extend the root system and you see that they are much finer than the plant roots so they can enter soil pores that the plant cannot access and then they take up nutrients from the soil and give them to the plant. The plant in turn um, performs photosynthesis and gives carbon back to the fungus so both partners benefit from this association. So I, I did a postdoc then uh, at UC Berkeley and there we um, looked at these mycorrhizal fungi in a long-term field trial, the, um, the century experiment at Russell Ranch in Davis, where since more than 25 years, different cropping systems are compared. And um, we were interested in the communities of mycorrhizal fungi in these systems and how they affect crop yield. So we selected four management systems there, and we planted two different tomato plants in these systems. So one is a normal tomato plant called 76R that forms regular associations with mycorrhizal fungi. And then we had this tomato mutant called RMC um, that has a mutation that prevents it from forming normal AMF associations. So they only form a, yeah, very reduced associations with AMF. Um, so we planted them there and then we looked at tomato yield to basically find out um, yeah, how yield is affected if we remove the mycorrhizal association from the crop. And um, we see here the data for the biomass on the left hand side on the, on the crop yield. Dark bars are the normal tomato plants and the light gray bars are the mutant plants with re reduced mycorrhizal colonization. And we see some differences here depending on the cropping system. But importantly, we see that um, when we remove mycorrhizal associations from the system, we get up to a 30% um, decline in yields. And also overall, we found a positive correlation. The more mycorrhiza we found in the plant roots, the higher tomato yields were. So I think this study also impressively shows that, that soil organisms can really or really do support agricultural yields and matter. So to sum up these um, studies, we, we saw that soil organisms possess a great potential to increase crop yields and simultaneously reduce nutrient pollution to the environment. And we could confirm um, these results in field settings. So soil life is a crucial factor for sustainable agriculture and uh, substantially supports crop yields and supporting your soil life is good for the environment good for the plants and good for you if you're a farmer so you have more money in your pocket um, and need less fertilizer for example so this is all very nice but um, we have to get this information out to the public and we don't have much time because soils are threatened. So we lose soils globally at an alarming rate. Um, and there's like problems like soil compaction, soil salinization, desertification and soil erosion through wind and water and also soil sealing through human activities that are major problems and also harm soil life. And most people or the general public is maybe not really aware that soils harbor an entire below ground universe. So actually um, one quarter of the global biodiversity is found in soils and one teaspoon of soil contains more living organisms than we are humans on this planet. Um, so there we got this idea, we, we have to do something to spread the word about these facts. And this is where the underpants come into play. Um, so we trying to make the soil life visible because it's very hard to see soil organisms. We saw the presentation before. Um, uh, so you need a microscope and then also you, you, yeah, it's hard to see them, but we try to make soil life visible by making underpants invisible because if you bury an underpant in the soil, it's cotton 
um, it will be decomposed by solar organisms and over time disappears. So we started um, a citizen science project called Beweisstück Unterhose. In English, it's a proof by underpants where we um, wanted to bury underpants together with the Swiss population um, and with the goal to raise the awareness about the importance of soils and also to perform some scientific assessments of soil biological activity and soil health across Switzerland. And also we want to develop recommendations for best management practices to support soil life. And I have to mention that we did not invent this idea of burying underpants. So this was actually a group of farmers in Canada that started with this in 2015. And um, it has already been done in several parts of the world. Currently, there's also a project in Hungary going on and in Australia. Yeah. Um, so how did we do it? We put together a soil lab kit, a DIY soil lab kit. So we um, provided standardized underpants to all the participants. We also included tea bags to look at the tea bag index, which is a scientifically more established method to look at decomposition processes in soil. Um, and so we, we put these things in a package and shipped it to all participants. And then they got instructions on how to bury the underpants. Then they take a soil sample, which they ship back to our labs. And um, they place the tea bags in the soil. And um, each participant received two underpants. So one will be uh, retrieved after one month, the other one after two months. Then we also, um, together with this partner, Spotteron, we've developed an app where the people can enter management data and information about the field where they bury the underpants and can also upload pictures of the underpants. And then they ship after the two months, they ship the soil sample and the underpants back to us to Acroscope and we analyze them. So we um, aimed for 1000 participants and actually all the available spots filled up before we officially announced the project. So there was really a huge interest. Um, and we aimed for 50% farmers and 50% non-farmers being private gardeners or just regular people. Um, we, we told them they can bury the underpants wherever they want, can be in the forest, can be in some rural spaces in the city, can be in their community garden, in their rooftop garden or in agricultural fields. And here you see a map from our web page and everyone in each of these dots actually re represents several spots where underpants are buried. So you can zoom in and see all the details and look at pictures and look at site information on our web page, which is available in three Swiss national languages. Yeah, then we had the goal to raise the awareness and um, we had an event for the media for the start of the project. And actually it was overwhelming how well this was picked up. So we were um, in the media globally with this project. Um, in in Ghana, in India, China, the US, and so on. And um, we also had several television features in Swiss and German television. And um, importantly, all these media releases talked about that soils are alive, soils are important, and soils are threatened, and we have to take care of them. So they really got our message across, which made us very happy. Um, we also uh, put together a picture book about soil life called The Jungle and Soil, but it's uh, only available in German and French. We think about releasing an English version. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, it's actually very entertaining and interesting. You can learn a lot there. And it's available in bookstores in Switzerland, Germany, Austria, or you can also directly order it through us. You can write an email, then you get also a special price when you get it through us. Yeah, and then there's still the scientific assessments to be made. So the research questions we're trying to answer with this project are um, how is soil biological activity distributed across Switzerland? And is this biological activity linked to soil biodiversity, soil quality, crop yields? And also how does management affect um, the soil biological activity? And um, 
yeah, we all also want to assess whether underpants can really serve as a meaningful and easy to use indicator for soil health that everyone can use in their backyard or wherever they want, because this method has never been scientifically assessed. So um, yeah, we really hope to get answers here how useful the underpants actually are. So right now we're dealing with uh, the samples. We have almost 900 soil samples, 1,600 underpants, 10,000 tea bags. We have a subset of soil samples where we look at soil microbial diversity, 800 questionnaires with site information management data. So we are really busy in the lab right now. So the underpants, they are photographed and then with imaging software, we determine the amount of degradation of the underpants, the tea bags are weighed. And um, yeah, we hope to be able to make recommendations for, for best management practices in spring of this year. What we can tell already or what we have already is data that the citizens actually entered in the app. So they could um, assess how strongly the underpants were degraded. Um, so we see here the results of the one month. So orange means the underpants are not very degraded. Green man means they're strongly degraded. So what we see so far after one month, month there's less degradation than after two months. And we see that there are no large scale spatial patterns. So um, yeah, looking at the details will be interesting, hopefully. So there's more to come. If you're interested, you can subscribe to our newsletter on our webpage. It's on the landing page you have to scroll to the bottom to find it or you follow us on facebook and instagram yeah and with this i'm at the end so i um, quickly acknowledge acknowledge people involved in this research plant soil interactions group at agroscope and my colleagues the project team of the underpants project people at uc davis and berkeley and i thank you for your attention i'm happy to take questions Thank you very much, Franz, um, for your talk. And now we also know what, <laughs> how, how it was all conducted regarding the pants and very um, inspiring, I want to say. Yeah? Maybe I'm start collecting some pants now, from now on. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Um, I will start right away with the question of Felix. Um, he's asking, how was the soil, soil uh, sterilized and how was uh, ensured that it was sterile? Um, we sterilized the soil with um, X-ray radi radiation. So uh, there are these companies that provide the service mostly for medical equipment. Um, and uh, yeah, depending on the dose of the radi radiation, you can determine how how sterile the soil is because there is always some bacteria that can survive such processes. Um, so we made sure that we did not have fungi in the soil anymore, no mycorrhizal fungi and um, insects, arthropods and so on. There might have been still some bacteria have been, oh, <laughs> sorry, alive in the soil. But um, yeah, but we um, also saw in our control treatments that um, they were mostly free of mycorrhiza, for example. We had some contamination probably through the air because it was outside. Um, and for the greenhouse, we often sterilize the soil with autoclaving. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, can you please uh, stop sharing this screen? Yeah, sure. I mean, I love the biodiversity of the, of the pants, <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. Um, OK, the uh, next question will be by Leendert. Uh, using two toma tomato varieties introduce more differences than um, equals minus AMF only. So how do you know the yield differences are AMF based? So these, uh, the, um, this mutant is actually derived from this 76R wild type that we used. So they are directly related and it should only be this uh, one mutation that, that um, causes differences in mycorrhizal colonization and this, um, pair of wild type and mutant has been used in, in several studies already. There have also been um, tests planting them in sterile soil to look at growth differences without mycorrhiza. And they show fairly similar, um, similar growth, even in sterile soil. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the next question by Vitalia is, um, 
how deep have you buried the panties and how do you account for the differences in land use? Because there is a huge difference in arable land and a heavily irrigated home garden. Yeah, that's um, so. First, first part of the question: we we buried the underpants vertically in the soil so that the the seam on the top looks out of the soil surface. Um, so it was yeah probably from zero to 15, 20 centimeters. They were buried in the soil. Um, and yeah, of course, there's a huge variation. And um, that's why we also tried with this app and questionnaires to get as um, detailed information as possible about what's happening on these field sites. Is it irrigated or not? How often is it irrigated? Which fertilizers do you use? Do you apply compost? Do you apply pesticides? Which crop is growing there and so on? And um, with all this information, we, we hope to really um, get meaningful answers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and how did you create the treatments with reduced and enhanced soil life? And maybe the first part of the other question of Italia? Um, yeah, so we, we used um, sievings basically. So we sift the soil through four millimeters. And um, then we had an additional step in the greenhouse. So we put the, the sift soil into sterile soil in the greenhouse and planted some plants in there and let them grow for three months to, um, yeah, to let the soil organisms propagate in these pots. And um, yeah, and for the, for the reduced soil life treatment, we filtered the soil through 11 micrometer filters and also added this to sterile soil in the greenhouse. So we had both treatments growing in the greenhouse in, in sterile substrate and only a small part of, of the two filtrates was added. So we tried to really make sure that, that um, yeah, the differences are similar except for the different organisms present. Okay, and another part of the question was, where do, you, where do the microbes come from and how much did you apply? Um, so we, we went to an agricultural field, like a pasture um, field here, close to our research station from a farmer and um, yeah, used just native soil organisms we found in that soil. Um, what was the second part of the question? Um, this, uh, I have to um, already, um, the second part, on one moment. Um, yeah, how much did you apply? Ah, yeah. Um, yeah. So we we produced this inoculum in the greenhouse, and um, then I think we, uh, if I remember correctly, it was about ten percent of the soil volume in this lysimeters was um, was the inoculum from the greenhouse, or maybe it was five percent or so of the volume. I'm not sure right now. I would have to look it up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, a little interruption. Um, I want to remind everybody, you don't have to do it now, but all the participants, uh, you have to refresh the browser because otherwise we will drop uh, out by five. I mean, maybe there will be, maybe we will be finished by five, but maybe it, it take a little bit longer. We, just that it's not like a really quick end. So maybe you re just refresh the browser uh, when you have time within the next uh, five minutes. Okay, and um, I would continue uh, with the questions. Michaela, she's asking, is intensive cropping always combined with bad soil life or is intensive uh, range from overuse, like the degraded soils from US to special used cropping systems with crop rotation and cover crops? Um, yeah, I probably there's also intensively managed systems where soil life is doing well. I think there's a lot of factors that play a role and it's always difficult to make these generalizations. And we also saw on the data that there's a huge variability in the data. So some cropping systems are doing better than, than others. Um, and I didn't, I don't remember the rest of the question. Yeah. So yeah. Is it, um, or, is it in intensive a range from overuse to special use cropping systems with crop rotation and cover crops? 
that's like the second part of the um, of the of the question. Yeah. Uh, so I think probably if I understand correctly, if if there's like a gradient of of um, yeah soil soil health from from more sustainably to more intensively managed systems um which i would say yes so you you can't cannot really put them in categories so this is good this is bad or the soil life is going bad good here and bad there so it's it's really a gradient and it really depends on on lots of details that we also don't understand at this point i guess okay thank you yeah. Uh, Rüter, she's asking, who paid about sending back soil samples, tea bags and pans? Participants or your organization? Uh, yeah, actually, the University of Zurich was mm -hmm. kind enough to sponsor the, the shipment. Um, so we sent the packages already with a return shipment label. They just have to had to put on the on the box and they could use the same box so we try to make it really easy for the participants to return the shipments mm -hmm. another question by marian uh, which results would you think the uh, lysimeter trials had shown if also slurry had been added um yeah that's a difficult question i don't I don't know. I think I, I would guess that um, in general, they they would have probably gone in a similar direction. But um, yeah, I, I can't really say a lot about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then was the question about this, uh, how the soil was sterilized and how was it ensured that it was sterile? Yeah. Yeah, but I answered this already, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's the thing. Like because it was not, um, so it showed like that it was answered, but it was already ah, okay. uh, answered, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, actually, all questions in the chat uh, are answered now. So um, the final question is, you know, it maybe already. What are the two uh, main take-home messages or the or one two things you want to share with us before you or we? leave the participants by five we try um yeah I, I think my main message is um make taking care of your soil a priority um it's really the the basis of human existence and then also of the functioning of planet earth so we really have to take care of the soil and uh get away from only focusing on yields, but really focusing on feeding the soil and keeping it healthy and alive so that we um, can rely on them also in, in 100 years from now. Okay, um, thank you very much. Wow, we are on time. Thank you, Franz. <laughs>